Today's going to be a really interesting day, and I wanted today to be just kind of a, a light, low, just a low kind of fun day. Uh, in case you didn't know it, if you're not a NASCAR freak like I am, today is the Daytona 500. So that's why we're, I should have put the memo up. So and look at this nice jacket. This is this is the coat of many colors right here. And so she's all got her her NASCAR thing going on and got other comments from the peanut gallery over there. And uh, that's the Blue Gallery. And uh, so it's going to be we're going to have fun. I almost want to have all the guys and gals who are really NASCAR freaks to come on over to the house. And and we may just oh look there's an awesome guy right there. He's retired now but that was going to be a really cool video and but we don't have the video up and going uh, but it is it is what it is but so seriously those of you who want to pop over to the house and you're NASCAR freak you like watching cars go around in circles um, you know you, you can come on over last week was awesome there was so many crashes it was just ah, so cool I'm just blown away that they get these guys are in all these crazy wrecks and they come out unscathed no bruises no batter I mean it's all good although I wouldn't want to be in there but I do have I do have some some quotes for the week and so like I said today's gonna to be a, a little low-key but here, here's a quote I told my wife she should embrace her mistakes so she hugged me <laughs> But then you hug me. I was just teasing. I was just teasing. Just teasing. We went to White Point the other night. Oh. Yeah, well, don't get carried away. It was just dinner. It was just macaroni and cheese or whatever it was. It, it was. it was really good. I, I saw something this week, and they had what I thought was beef. And it was corned beef. Whatever it was, gross. Huh? Yeah. It was corned beef hashy stuff. But anyway, so I was doing this a video today, or watching this video this week, of, uh, of a guy, Todd White. Some of you saw Todd White. And, um, and I, I posted it in the group, and I was so uh, moved by this particular video that um, I actually posted something on the, online. But he said this, he says, I live my life out loud, out loud by loving people for a living. I live my life out loud by loving people for a living. How many of that would just, how many would love for that to be the caption of, of our church? Yeah. Yeah. You know, that, and we, we've been talking about that loving with intentionality, loving people beyond their face, loving people beyond their nationality, loving people beyond their stuff. Yeah. How many of people come to church with stuff? And most of those people are you and I. We all come with stuff and we all come with junk. Aren't you glad that the person who introduced you to Christ didn't prejudge you prior to you coming? Or at least that, <laughs> that, that didn't happen. But this week it was a really interesting time at the dealership. And I had a lady come in who wasn't really happy. I was like, I'm not sure she's ever been happy. But, um, but she, she, she just, just wasn't happy. And so I just thought, you know, how am I going to diffuse this? And so basically I told her, I said, I make a living loving on people and, 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 and trying to make them happy. And how did that just knock her for a loop? She was just like, what? Mm -hmm. She didn't know what to do with all that. I didn't even know, I couldn't even believe I was actually saying that because I make a living loving on people and making them happy. And, but it didn't make her happy. But it, it, made, it made me happy to the point that I got to say something. And, but today I want to talk to you a little bit about, about this right here, that, that let's go racing because now that football's over, it's racing season. And for those of you who aren't good redneck, red, rednecks in racing, you have absolutely no idea what I'm talking about. And this message will probably be nothing to you in the beginning, but maybe it'll mean something to you uh, later on. So we're going to talk a little bit about Let's Go Racing. So um, some of you might know that this next thing, this thing right here, this is a tribute to Tom to bring right here. Hey. Yeah, it's a tribute. Look, who's the, look who won. Uh, <laughs> so he's going, yay, Jeff Gordon won the finish line. So it's a tribute to Tom. Yay. That's just between he and I. It's just, just forget you guys. That's just between him. But let's go to the next one right, right here. How many know Jeff Foxworthy? Anyone heard of Jeff Foxworthy? Okay, Jeff Foxworthy. Now we're getting, now we're getting home. Okay. Now we know who the real rednecks are. <laughs> According to Jeff Foxworthy, you might be a NASCAR redneck if the first buck you shot was on a sign. <laughs> you might be an NASCAR redneck if you run your business from a phone. 
thought it was funny. Pay phone. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You might be a NASCAR redneck if your if you if your pet nickname for your wife is Love Nut. <laughs> he says you might be a NASCAR redneck if you could change a tire faster than you could change a diaper. Hmm. You might be a NASCAR redneck if you spend more time on the top of a motorhome than in one. Truth. And those of you who don't watch racing, this is just really going south really fast. <laughs> You might think that you're a NASCAR redneck when the last four words of the national anthem are "Gentlemen, start your engines." Yeah. Okay. And the last one, just to save the time and the misery, is uh, you might be a NASCAR redneck um, if, if uh, what I put, if someone asks the time at church and you answer an hour and a half till race time. Yeah. <laughs> or you might be a NASCAR redneck if it's something like this. <laughs> Have you ever done toilet seat horseshoes? <laughs> I'm serious, we did that. We went out one place and I, I just bought toilet seats. Remember that? And we, we had the little spikes up there and we were taking the toilet seat. It was really weird because you have to have a really heavy one, otherwise the thing is flying all over the place. But you can tell you're a real NASCAR. You think I'm kidding, they do this. Oh, look at this. How bad do you want to win? Bad enough to win. How did, that could be a title of a sermon right there. How bad do you really want to win? How many realize I love winning? I love winning more than losing. I don't love, I don't I am not a good loser. Ask Cheryl. I am not a good loser. I am a whiner when I lose. I'm a whiner, but I love winning. How many love winning? You know, some of you are not going to vote for anything. So, okay, maybe that's why the guy's in office. Well, here we go. What? What did I say wrong? Well, all kidding aside, ladies and gentlemen, because we are alive. NASCAR is one of the all-time favorite sports and all around. It's one of the best current national uh, pastimes. I actually found out last night, and I noticed that most um, sports, are they have a 7% loss. I'm sorry, 5% loss in their ratings, but NASCAR, surprisingly, has a 7% increase in their ratings. I mean, what else are you going to find a quarter of a million people wrapped up in one great big circle? I mean, it is, it is pretty crazy what goes on, what goes on there. And it's actually the second most watched um, um, sporting event outside of the NFL regular preseason games. I remember many times I've taken my kids to NASCAR events. My son Ryan, who's like, how old is Ryan now? 33 or 34? Holy moly. So he's getting up there, mid-30s. Mid and I remember when he was small and I took him to the Michigan Motor Speedway. You're going to love this. And we took him to the Michigan Motor Speedway and it, I don't know what lap it was, but it started raining and they had to call the race. And there was just so many, just so many people uh, at this race. And, uh, and so on, on the way home, um, my Ryan had to go to the bathroom. And so I said, well, there's a port potty over there. So he went to the bathroom. I, I don't know what happened, but I turned my back and I totally lost him. I could not find him anywhere. And I'm crying. I'm freaking out. I can't find my little kid. And finally, eventually, I, I find him. I couldn't even remember where I parked the car. I mean, it was just that many people in this pasture. But the cool thing about it is we're on our way home. And he said, he's like 12 of them, maybe less than that. He was little. Yeah. <laughs> okay, he was a little kid. All right. But he said this. He said, Dad, you know the best thing about this race for us? I said, what's that? He said, just being with you. Aww. I said, oh, man. I'm going to take him to another one. <laughs> that's all it takes. How do I good when you're a hero in front of your kids? Yes. I mean, that's like... That's like the ultimate is to be a hero because most parents are nerds, you know, in front of the eyes of their kids, you know, and and and, it, you know, and, and it, it, it's it's weird. I mean, with my family, some of you know, I'm, I I my wires are typically crossed anyway. But with, but with my kids, I told them when they were young, I would always snap my fingers. This is a little off. The, I snap my finger, they'd come running to give me a hug and a kiss. I snap my fingers, and I'm like, oh, there's power. But I don't know what happened. But they got older, and the thing just it wasn't quite working anymore. It's really weird. But I told the kids, I said, I don't care how old you'll be, you'll never be too old to give your daddy a hug and a kiss. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I remember they would come and they would just jump and they would cuddle and do all this kind of stuff. Now, it could be a little weird, but the point is that we have a really, really affectionate, lovey-dovey family. And with all of our boys, it doesn't matter if they're, 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 they're like 34 to uh, 31, especially Denny. Denny is ridiculously affectionate. And, and, and even Mike as a football guy, sometimes they go, yeah, seriously, the guys are... <laughs> <laughs> He'll do it. Cody, my daughter. <laughs> that was a waste of time. She like, anyhow. <laughs> but I don't know. <laughs> NASCAR is the only major sport in the U.S. which opens its weekly ceremonies with an invocation. Yes. And it's not just any prayers. It's always a really strong Christian one invoking the blessings of Jesus on the event and the participants. I was a NASCAR chaplain with Motor Racing Outreach. And I got to go down to Charlotte and be a part of the motor racing outreach family down there um, with Delaware Motor Speedway in Ontario. Uh, I got to represent Impact Church every Friday night uh, doing the racing, and that was really kind of cool. And everybody stood up, removed their caps, and you know we, we did our thing. And it was kind of a generic prayer that motor racing outreach kind of has anyway. But the fact that you know it, it is the only, and especially in a situation where there's all kind of you know contradictions and stuff with, with, with prayer now but with, that's what I love about NASCAR is they always always and they don't care They're, that's just the way they are it's a really strong Christian knit family obviously not everybody is Christian especially if you hear stuff on the radio but but the point is that they always open stuff up with an invocation and I've always appreciated that I've always loved that in that NASCAR family so I thought that was really kind of kind of cool in fact Christian influences are prevalent in the sport from sponsors to driver testimonies that track side prayer services privately owned companies uh, sanctioned stock car racing uh, the, the new uh, number 24 uh, kid who took the place of Jeff Gordon actually he uh, went to school at Liberty University and a real strong Baptist kid and just loves the Lord and, and um, you'll see it today if you do watch the race that the number 24 is all Liberty University and so I love the fact that that they're not afraid just to just to, to bolster that uh, bolster their faith and, it, and it's really kind of cool seeing what what is, what is going on and a lot of ways is very very similar to our to our walk with God you know because they there we have this win-loss type of uh, mentality and in all racing there's this process known as qualifying for a race and if your performance is good enough if you're fast enough if you're consistent enough if you qualify one of the for one of the top positions known as the pole that they're phrased on there is, is the goal is the pole so their, their goal from pole is always the, the first part but they're always trying to qualify but how many of the bible tells us that there's a problem with us qualifying for the race of heaven that we're never really going to be good enough and we don't have what it takes to qualify because of our own abilities but roman 3 23 says that you know all of sin we've heard this verse before that all of sin had come short of the glory of God. And sometimes it's the glory. Some of us, we've all come short of the glory or, or His glory. That, that people are always striving and are trying to be performance oriented. Uh, sometimes, uh, what do they call um, um, charismatic calisthenics that to, to try to gain God's approval. And how many know, sometimes when we look at Scripture, we said that it is God that qualifies us. In, in, in uh, Colossians 1 and 12, it says that giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the the saints in the kingdom of light. I love the fact that God qualifies you and I. It's not that we jump all in through these hoops and we have to do all this stuff that we'll never make it. And if we think that we're going to make it just on our own effort, then we're going to be sadly mistaken. God says, I'm going to help you do that. And I love in the Living Bible, as I was preparing this morning, Paul says that we're praying too, that you will be filled with his mighty, glorious strength so that you can keep going no matter what happens. Always full of the joy of the Lord and always thankful to the Father who has made us fit to share all the wonderful things that belong to those who live in the kingdom of life. That God qualifies us. And that's exciting knowing that daddy's on your side. He's embracing you. He's hugging you. He, he, he is encouraging you. He's, he's there with you. And I remember when, you know, when Mike was playing football in high school. And, and um, I would never miss, his, never miss his practice. And there was times that he felt like he wasn't good enough. There was times that he felt like he just didn't measure up. And he wasn't lifting enough. And he wasn't running faster. And I told him, it doesn't matter what you do. Daddy's always going to be on your side if you're first, second, third, or last. It doesn't matter. What really matters is that you participate in the game and you don't quit. Because quitters never win and winners never quit. You just got to keep on plugging. And, and I'm always giving this whistle. It'd be like that. He'd be up there, you know, because he was a running back, and he'd be running, and, and, and in the midst of all the crowds, all he heard was, and he would stop, and he would know that it was dead. 
How many know that Daddy God has a signal for you? That's why we listen. We hear what he says. And you might hear all kinds of stuff. You might be in a hospital or a nursery as a mother, and you'll hear all kinds of babies crying, but you know your baby sound. You know, your, you know the sound of your baby. And it's the cool thing about here that no matter what's going on in your life, if you, if you just pause for just a second, then you'll still hear that still small voice. You'll know because God's whisper is very distinct for everybody. It's not just this one generic, Thou shalt tear the land of the Lord thy God. It's not like this Charlton Heston Moses, you know, kind of voice. But God speaks to you in all sorts of different ways. And I love that. Lake Speed. He says, there's a, a thing up here. Lake Speed has been one of the most prominent racers of the NASCAR circuit. And he said, most of my life I had all the things that the world says will make you happy. The big house, the cars, and boat. And I, and I was very successful. But there was still an emptiness inside. That nothing else had worked up to this time. Fame, money, success, and all the toys. He said, after that I started going to church. And really got into reading the Bible. And Christ was the answer for me. And he put me back together. I love the fact that God put him back together. Daryl Walter. Uh, Daryl Walter uh, is in NASCAR. He's in the NASCAR Hall of Fame. And he said it wasn't until 1983 that Walter put his trust in Christ. However, it would be another decade or so before he began to feel convicted about not putting God first in his life. He said that's when he began to look at the needs of others as being more important than his own. And God had blessed him greatly. And now he decided that he'd spend the rest of his life trying to serve God by serving others. And he, he's the one that came up with the idea of motor racing outreach. And that motor racing outreach, if you're a chaplain with that, it's a pretty strict organization because they don't they don't really mess around uh, you know, with NASCAR. But they, they value Christ. They value the convictions. And Kyle, Kyle Petty was another one. He says Petty realized that even though he'd been uh, going to church all of his life, he felt like he was just going through the motions. Anybody echo that one sometimes? Just going through the motions. He said something was missing. After his uncle was killed in a pit, uh, a pit road accident, he realized that if racing was going to be his life, he needed the sovereign hand of God in his life. And he turned his life over to the Lord. And he said that unless you build your house on the rock, it's going to fall and it's going to fall very hard. Some of you might know a guy named Bobby Labonte. Bobby, Bobby Labonte said, when we turn our lives over to God, we should say, here are the, key, here are the keys, God. You drive. And now he understands that, that God's the one directing the car. So I love the fact that there's a lot of NASCAR guys there that, that make no bones about it. They're not ashamed of their faith. And they publicly, boldly proclaim you know, that Jesus is Lord. And I love the fact that God is doing something significant, not just in NASCAR circles, but God is doing something significant significant in all the sports realms. He's doing something so powerful in, in, in media. He's doing po something powerful. Say what you want with Kanye. Say what you want with Justin Bieber. But the fact is that God is using people of influence to proclaim His word, His name, His mission. And it's exciting seeing that and all the world will know. And there's all sorts of other media guys that are kind of coming out of the closet. I just wish that the church would come out of the closet sometimes. Man, there's all kinds of things coming out of the closet. Maybe we might need to come out of the closet too. But God is doing something so powerful. That's why people are watching on Facebook. That's why people are they're listening to the news. They're listening to this because they want a word that's relevant. They want a word that's real. They want to know that God is more real than a picture of stained glass window and a curse word in the hallway of a high school. God is doing something significant. And I, I love down south, they want to always say, get up in the spout where the glory comes out. Because God is doing something cool. And you know, you're in the midst of it. So, you know, there's no way that we can sit with arms folded going, yeah, okay, so what? But God is doing something cool. God is doing something awesome. God is doing the very same thing that you prayed for. And I love the fact that God is doing it. And he's doing it right here. Hebrews chapter 12, we all know this verse. The scene is said in Hebrews 12 that, that there's, a, there's a track and field event, so to speak. That the runners have gathered and the event is about to begin. And we read in verse 1 of Hebrews chapter 12. It says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. 
For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls as well. And we always think about this, this scripture as that there's this, this great you know, cloud of witnesses that they're, that they're rooting you on. And I'm sure that there's a school of thought that believes that as well. But the question, are the witnesses uh, just, just cheering you on uh, for the fact of cheering you on? Or, or what does the word witnesses really mean? If you look it up, it actually means martyr. That these are the martyrs. These are the people who have gone before you. It wasn't that there was just a group of people cheering you on. And yes, you can look at it that way if you want to. That we're all in this race and people cheering you on. Yes, you can make it. But these are the people who lay down their lives that are cheering you on. That whenever you feel like you're down on down the dumps and you feel like you're discouraged, you feel like throwing in the towel, and you feel like quitting, you feel like canning, it, and you feel like going, oh, forget it. It's useless. It's worthless. It's done. What, what a waste of time. No, you've got people who are saying, no, you can make it. And they're going to pick you up, pull up your your bootstrap, and they're gonna make you go. They're gonna they're gonna put you on your shoulders if they have to. You see, that's what loving is all about. When we talk about loving people, it's not just oh, let me love you on Sunday morning. It's not let me love you when you when you come for a, a potluck dinner. It's loving you Monday through Wednesday through Thursday, all throughout that time. I've got guys in the dealership, and I love these guys. They're awesome. I heard one guy. He said, "Man, I'm in love with a man." Oh, that would be a little weird. I'm in love with him, but his name is Jesus. Can you imagine what would happen when we just say something? Anything? Well, sometimes like, oh, I don't know, because I don't know what they're going to think. I just want to know what God thinks. God thinks, hey, that was awesome. Amen. I live my life loving on people. I was so wrecked. If you ever watch the video that I posted on Facebook, please, please, please yeah, go watch it. It'll mess you up. Some of you don't want to be messed up because you like the way your package is. And I looked at I watched that and I, and I, I told Sheriff, I said, man, honey, remember we used to do all that stuff? You know, go buy people, get people, get, we gave our, our car away. <laughs> I don't know, the stuff that we have is just, we think it's our stuff. Yeah. But as a believer, everything that we have is God's. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. See, if you if you if you just quit holding on to earthly possessions, you wouldn't be tied here so bad. Amen. There's nothing here that I want. Yeah. Well, let's say maybe some more lobster. But I mean, there, there's a lot of things that I like here, but I'm not tied here. When I gave my life to Christ, I gave everything to Him, not just my Sunday morning self. Yeah, I gave Him everything. So when I look at my cars and I feel like, you know, and it happened a few years ago that God spoke to us to give a car away. And we're like, yeah, here, you know, because I'm not tied to it because I know that God will provide another way of transportation for me. Amen. God, we were, I got I to share you, I got to tell you that we were in Florida a couple years, well, a long, long, long time ago. And I, I remember at, we were at this church and I don't think I've ever shared this story. We're at this church and a pastor told me, he said, if anybody comes knocking, what? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm in the middle of an end. <laughs> Commentary. <laughs> he said, just go with the flow. You just messed up my one. He goes, <laughs> he goes, knock, knock. I now I know I'm knocking on the thing anymore. So <laughs> he says, if anybody comes knocking at the door, he said, don't pay them any attention because they're a professional bum. And I'm like, what's that all about? And so we went downtown and we were selling our CDs and our tapes to bookstores. And I had a guy come up and he said, sir, 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 excuse me, sir. And all I can remember was the, was the voice that was planted in my brain. Don't pay any attention to them because they're a professional bum. But I said, you know what? I turned around anyway. How many, and you know what? When I turned around, Steve, you, you haven't heard the story. So how many of you have never heard this story before? Thank you. Okay, so when I turned around, it was the first time, I would say, in a long time, if not in ever, that I ever looked at anybody through the eyes of Jesus. How many of you, let's go, let's say, how many of you ever, when you looked at somebody, that you looked at somebody through the eyes of Jesus? So what I mean by that was that you were driven by compassion. You weren't driven by opinion. You were driven by compassion. And I looked at that guy for the first time, and I'm like, boom, and I, I heard a story. And I was like, man, if, 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 I'm, if I'm getting burnt by this guy's story, I'd much rather be burnt and have a soft heart than just have a cold heart and just not paying any attention at all as a Christian. So I looked at him and I was like, man, what's, what's the story? He said, well, my wife had cancer, she died, and I, I just was devastated. I said, tick, I can believe that. He said, I was, 
I was just so devastated with everything that I just, I, I just had to get away. And how many of you have a level sometimes you just have to you get away? And he said, I was hitchhiking from Jacksonville down to Miami. And he said, I just had to get away. And he said, I got down to Miami and he said, I got mugged. I said, I can believe that. He is, he, the soles on his shoes were like flapping, you know, like, like this. He, his fingers were all rolled up from the cigarettes that he was burning, and, uh, that he was smoking. And he, was, he used to go to a church of God church. He said, I used to go to church. I used to be all, all in that stuff. And I got, I got cancer, and it just so messed me up. And I just had to get away, and I had to just walk away. And, and now I just left everything behind, and I'm, I'm just fumbling my way through. And so finally, you know, he, I, I said, you know, let's go back to the church for a minute. And I took him back to the place that they told me not to bring to. And so I went back there and, you know, we, we gave him some toothpaste and he burst off three of his teeth. And we, we gave him a blow dry and he, and he blew dry, you know, the however many strands of hair that he had. And, and I gave him a sweater and some stuff and I took him to get a steak dinner and all this stuff. And the weirdest thing about it was that we, we brought him down to the, the Quincy's or whatever it was to get him a steak dinner. And, he's, and he got his glass of tea and I turned around and the dude was gone. He was gone. Now you can read in this however way you want to read in this. It could have been an angel. It could have been a guy that just disappeared. It could have been whatever the case was. But the story wasn't so much about him as much as it was about what God was doing for me. That I want to encourage you that if you're going to say that I'm a Christian, live like it or get out of the way. Yeah. Because there's nothing worse than just being a hypocritical person that goes to Sunday, do your Sunday morning thing, and that's the end, that's the end of it. Live for Jesus on Wednesday. Yeah. Be a testimony on Tuesday. Proclaim his name on Thursday. Boast his name on Friday. Go to where people are. I don't care if you go to, if you're going to go to a bar, at least love the people while you're there. Yeah. Be the closest thing to Jesus that people will ever see. Because they don't care if you go to church. Oh, that might sound weird. They don't care if you go to church. They want to know, do you know Jesus? And I am doing my very best to be the closest thing to Jesus that anybody in my dealership has ever seen in their entire life. Not to, just, not to boast me, but I want Jesus alive in me. And I pray for the guys all the time. And if they're watching, that's probably going to freak them out. But it is what it is, and too bad. So when we think about these, this great cloud of witnesses, we think about Abel. Abel was there having offered a better sacrifice, a sacrifice offered with an attitude of faith. Abraham was there in that great cloud of witnesses, a man who was willing to leave the land of his father and follow God's command to go to a country that they'd never seen before. Enoch was there, a man not known for his impressive accomplishments, but rather for his walk with God. Because we've seen it all the time. Nobody gives a Rip Van Winkle about your plaques and your trophies and all your acknowledgments. So what? All they really want to care about is do you care for them? Yeah. I want us to be a people that cares for people. Noah was there. A man who trusted God enough to withstand the ridicule of his neighbors and obey God's command. And spent 120 years building a boat in preparation for something that they've never seen before. A flood. God told him, can you imagine what that would have been like? I'm building a boat. What are you doing? Building a boat. What's a boat? They never heard what a boat was. Building a boat. 50 years into it, bang, 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 bang. What are you doing? Building a boat. What for? <laughs> for the flood. What a flood? We haven't seen rain here in years. But God told me to build a boat. You're smoking dope. Yeah. <laughs> You're crazy. You're weird. Can you imagine all the ridicule that he got building a boat in preparation for something that they had never seen before? Can you imagine the ridicule you're going to get when you begin to prepare for revival and, and something that the region has never seen before, but you keep praying for it, you keep believing for it? When you keep preparing for people coming to Jesus left, right, and getting baptized every Sunday morning? What are you doing? I'm preparing. We're actually right now looking to get a baptism thing. We're going to put it right there. Because there will come a time well, we will be baptized to people every Sunday. You watch. Yeah. You watch. I ain't coming around here playing tiddly wings. <laughs> First Corinthians 9.24 says, drink water. Oh. That doesn't say that, but it sure sounds good. It says, do you not know that those who run the race all run, but one receives the prize. Run in such a way that you may obtain it. The word run in the Greek word is trekto. 
and it indicates a constant and a con uh, continuous pace. It depicts a runner or a racer in a huge stadium before adorning crowds of fans in order for him to win every ounce of his strength and complete attention to detail is required. If we're going to pull this off, not just, not just, not just going to church. Even that's a monumental task in the region. I get it. <laughs> but if we're going to pull this thing off of being like Christ, it's going to take everything you got. It's going to take more than just putting up with me on a Sunday morning. It's going to take some diligence. It's going to take getting in the Word. It's going to take just being saturated in God's presence. And not just so saturated that you can convince your friends that you're more spiritual than they are because you have your Bible full of crayon marks and you're highlighted. How many have ever been to conference sometimes when all the super hyper spiritual people who highlight their Bibles hold it out here so you can they so you can see, you know, how spiritual they think they are. But when it comes to winning souls, they're like, oh, that's not my calling. Paul had this in mind when he wrote the next verse because people, people compete for one or two reasons. They like the sport and they want the victory. I am a very, Ryan might know a little bit, but <clears throat> I'm a very competitive guy. No. I'm, at the, <laughs> I'm a very weakling. I confess, I give in, I cower. No! I'm competitive in everything that I do. It's, it's my it's my nature, it's my makeup. <clears throat> Even when it comes to car sales, I'm like, yeah, okay. To me, every no is one step closer to a yes. Even though people say no, great, I'll get the next one. Great, I'll get the next one. Oh, I got the next one. Good, can't wait for the next one. When people come to Christ, I'm not like, oh, there's one for the year, I'm done. No. I'm like, great, there's one. Well, maybe they know someone who needs Jesus too. Let's go after that one too. We had a meeting on Thursday night, and, and John and, and uh, I mean, I'm Stephen Lord came over, and I, I was like, you know, the, the, the Denny Durant said last week in the message, he said, you know, evangelism isn't what we do, it's what we are. Christianity isn't what we do, it's what we are. Mm -hmm. That we live the life in front of people. Mm -hmm. Ah. Here's a good phrase, because I said it. It's right there. You can't possess what you're not willing to pursue. You can't possess what you're not willing to pursue. That if we want more of God, so to speak, then we pursue that. You put yourself in a position where God can move in you. I mean, it's very hard to be intimate with somebody if your back is turned towards them. Try it. That's really weird. I mean, can't you? It's a little weird. But we're, we position ourselves in a place where God's presence can so fill our little palace that we get so full of Jesus that, that you're like a volcano. You're, you're, you're getting so erupted by his presence. you got to go lay your hands on something before you explode. Yeah. And people are like, yeah, I used to be. How many, let's, can we be real? How many would say, in all honesty, that I used to be more on fire when I first gave my life to Christ than I am now. My hands up. The rest of y'all, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. <laughs> But it's fact. And I don't know what it is in this progression, in this transition that put us where we are right now. But I want to go back. I want to go back because I'm tired of living in the smoke when I can walk in the fire. Mm. Amen. I want to have the fire of God so stick and real. Mm. Be like, oh, you're radical. Yes, I am. Remember, radical Christianity is normal Christianity. Anything less than that is subnormal. I don't want to just get by. Oh, God. The Greek word for victory is Nike. And Nike means more than a conqueror. It says, you know, I, I'm not just, I, I haven't just conquered something that I, I'm more than that. I'm more than a Nike. And one of the keys of being successful in anything you do is being persistent. 
It's the ability to maintain action regardless of your feelings. That you press on even when you feel like quitting. And when, when, you're work, when, when you work on, on, on any big goal, that your motivation will wax and wane like waves hitting the shore. And sometimes you'll feel motivated, sometimes you won't. But it's not your motivation that will produce results. It's your action that produces results. Persistence allows you to keep, keep taking action even when you don't feel motivated to do so. And therefore, you keep accumulating results. Listen to this. Persi per what do you call it? Persistence is the prescription for possibility. It's the prescription for possibility. Persistence. That you keep on going and you keep on pushing and you keep on going. I don't know. Whenever we... I keep kind of going back to what, you know, our Mardi Gras days and our St. Patrick's days and all this stuff where we did, where we were so, uh, we were so, we were just so full of Jesus that we never even gave any entertainment to being wrong. We would just go do it. And we were like, our, our motto back then was like, well, let's just go do it. What's the worst thing that can happen? We do it wrong. But I would always say back then, I'd much rather do something wrong for God by doing something than something right for the enemy by sitting back and doing nothing. Okay, praise the Lord. <laughs> Dale Carnegie says, he says, most of the important things in the world have been accomplished by people who have kept on trying where there seemed to be no hope at all. Louis Pasteur, he said, let me tell you the secret that has led me to my goal, that my strength lies solely in my tenacity. <sighs> What's the strength of a pit bull? He bites onto something and he doesn't let go. <sighs> Unlike a Bichon Freeze or something like that. We had one. He was like, eh. <laughs> That's about that as aggressive as that thing got. It's really weird. So we be persistent. Be persistent in what you believe. How many would believe that doubt is deadly? <laughs> the very moment that you start doubting stuff, it's, it's treacherous. Yeah. Doubt is deadly. Faith without works is, de is dead. Faith is the persistence. Listen to this. Faith is the persistence what doubt is the failure. Faith is the persistence what doubt is the failure. The person, listen to this. You're going to love this. The person who is not persistent has never really been persuaded and will never be persuasive. Let me say it again. The person who is not persistent has never really been persuaded and will never be persuasive. Because if you're not persistent, you're always looking for a way out. If you're not persistent and you're not diligent, then you're looking for a door. You're looking for an excuse. You're looking for an exit. And if you're looking for an exit, you'll never be persuasive. You know why? Because no one will trust us. No one will believe in you. Because all there all, all is is this. We're all just, just lip service. And no matter what form of racing you enjoy, the final objective for everyone who is in the competition is to gain the victory and to win the prize. The video that we were going to try to show earlier was really interesting because it was one who was who was the guy, Mark Martin. And Mark Martin, Mark Martin rededicated his life to Christ. It was a great big accident. And how I many when you're in accidents and when, when tragic things happen, it's amazing how close that people really get to Jesus in the tail end. I want to give you four things, like super duper really fast. Everybody say super duper really fast because the meal out there is killing me because I smell it and it's driving me absolutely nuts. And I know you do this on purpose. And I think some of you are just that mean enough that you're going to bring something that I like every Sunday morning so I can get done with this stuff faster. And I know that. And besides, the race is on at 3.30, so I'm going to be done by then. Super duper fast. Here we go. First, four things really quick. We've got to lay aside every hindrance. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let it, let it, sin is anything, good or bad, that prevents the flow of God in our life. Can we disagree with that one? It is anything. I remember back in the day, my mama down in Savannah, Georgia, she thought if I played softball on Sunday, I was going to hell. No lie. Back in the South, if you went bowling, you were going to hell. If you swam, if there was a girl and a guy in the pool, you're all going to hell. I mean, it was crazy back then. 
It's religious. I would. I heard a story. Honestly, good. It's a story. I won't tell you what denomination it was, but it was a story. And they, they had a board meeting. I mean, those would kill anybody. There was a board meeting, and the board decided. This was the topic of the debate. Can men wear hairspray? Can men use hairspray? That was the board meeting. So all these highly intelligent religious men said they finally concluded that men they cannot wear hairspray. But they can spray their hair with water. And that was godly. But you can't use hairspray. I'm like, seriously? No wonder everybody don't want nothing to do with church. It's really weird. But he says, lay aside everything. Will, uh, Wilbert Chapman said, the rule of my life is this. Anything that dims my vision of Christ, or takes away my taste for Bible study, or cramps my prayer life, or makes, uh, makes Christian word, di uh, word difficult, it is wrong for me. And as a Christian, I must turn from that very thing. Think about that. He said, anything, it could be anything. Mm -hmm. Anything that prevents, anything that hinders, whatever that is. And it doesn't mean that one size fits all. Because I mean we're all on this, we're all on a journey. But everybody has a different hurdle or a different obstacle that they that they want to cross. That, that your conviction may not be mine, and mine may not be yours. But we all have something that we're typically working on. The second thing. Is that we run with endurance. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And even when I when I looked at that scripture, I thought that that can't be God because it says something about running. And I'm not running anywhere. I don't care. I tried running last time, and my belly didn't quit jiggling for 20 minutes. It was like jiggle, jiggle, jiggle. It's a wood stop. I'm like, nah, I ain't doing this again. Last time I ran, I, my fat was jiggling so much my belly button gave me hickey on the forehead. And I said, I'm not doing that anymore. <laughs> Forget this running stuff. That's just that just can't be. That just can't be. But it is in scripture, so it says we're gonna calm down, calm down, all you people. Yeah. Tim, <laughs> sorry, it's just in the it's getting close to dinner time. <laughs> Second Timothy four seven eight. Paul says, "I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not to me, but all who have longed and loved for His appearing." I love the word endurance. Endurance in, in the Greek is epitome. Or, 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 um, I'm sorry, whatever. It's that up there. It's the steady determination to keep going. It means continuing when everything in you wants to slow down or give up. How many have ever felt like slowing down, giving up, throwing in the towel? Like, no, it's not me, but you're like, get behind me. I'm moving forward for God. I don't care what people think or what they say. Then I'm going to be persistent no matter what I do. You must be persistent in your plan. A plan is a written list of arranged actions necessary to achieve a, 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 a goal. Sometimes you have to do something that you hate to create something that you love. Sometimes you got to create something that you got to do something that you hate to create something that you love, and whatever whatever discipline that is. I don't like still high. She's structured. I don't like structure. I'm like, let's just go. God will provide. I'm the visionary. She's the critic. In a nice way. We make a great team. We really truly balance you. If, if it was just me, we'd be in trouble. We'd probably be in debt because I'm like, let's just do it and trust God. And I'm now I'm like, let's do it. Much to cost. Like, who cares what it costs? Let's just do it. No, how much that cost? I thought you'd drive me crazy. You're stifling my vision. No, she's balancing the vision. That's a good place to pay. praise the Lord for Pastor Cheryl. The hey. Hey. Third, we must shift our focus, looking unto Jesus, the author and finish of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I like the word looking. It comes from a Greek word, another Greek word. It has the idea of concentrating your gaze. It means to look look away from other things so that you can focus all your attention on that particular object. Number four, everybody say number four, we're almost done. Hallelujah. It's great. Five to twelve. Is that we consider the Savior. Verse three. It says, so consider carefully how Jesus faced such intense opposition from sinners who oppose their own souls so that you won't become worn down and cave in under life's pressures. It's an interesting fourth point that we consider everything in our lives and we consider all the options. And just like this is the last point, that quite often we consider Jesus as the last time as well. 
I heard a guy recently, it was a, I can't remember the whole story, but he was asked, you know, uh, who are you? And we'll just pick on, we'll just pick on sales. Uh, I'm a car salesman. Okay. Yeah, but, but who, who are you? Uh, well, I, I'm, you know, and, and what are you? You know, well, I'm, I'm, I'm from Nova Scotia. Well, that, that's, no, that's where you live. You know, who, who are you? Oh, I'm, I'm Irish and Italian. No, that's, that's your nationality. I'm a car salesman. No, that's your job. You know, who are you? What is your line of priorities? And finally, at the end of all these things, he finally says, I'm a Christian. He said, well, that's kind of funny because when I asked you who you are, the Christianity was the very last thing when it should be the very first thing. Who are you? If you ever get to watch that video by Todd, I'm telling you, for those of you who don't like to be messed up, come on, sure, it's going to mess you up. What do you do? Why well, make a living loving on people? I live my life out loud, making a living loving on people.